Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. I'm Brad Lander, Chair of the Committee. We're joined this morning by several other members of the Committee and the Council. Uh, we have uh, Committee Member Jumani Williams from Brooklyn, and we're also joined by some other Council Members, uh, Council Member Bill Perkins from Manhattan, Council Member Jimmy Vaca from the Bronx, and, and I suspect some others may join us along the way. Uh, thanks to our counsel, Elizabeth Guzman, and to the staff of the Council's Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, the Director, as well as Andre Johnson-Brown. They've prepared background materials on both of the nominees that we'll be considering this morning. So background materials are in front of members, along with the uh, written answers that they prepared in advance to a set of questions that the staff gave them. Uh, we're doing two uh, hearings this morning. Today, the Council will consider two candidates. Nasser Sheta for appointment to the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals, or the BSA, as the engineer member uh, to fill a vacancy and serve the remainder of a six-year term that expires on January 1st, 2023. Um, and Michael Rivadenera, Rivadenera, am I saying that right? Rivadenera, for appointment as the Bronx representative, which is why we're glad to have Jimmy Vaca here from the Bronx, as the Bronx representative uh, nominated by the council to the Civilian Complaint Review Board to succeed Yungik Yoon and serve the remainder of a three year term that expires on July 4th, 2019. Um, we're going to hear from and, and ask questions of Mr. Sheta first, and then after that, uh, Mr. Rivadenera. Uh, the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals consists of five commissioners, each appointed by the mayor for a term of six years. Um, and I'll flag for members and for the public, this is different from some of the commissions that we appoint where folks sort of are more like a board. This is a full-time paid job that involves an awful lot of technical expertise. These are the folks who, together with the chair, really review applications that come before the BSA. Uh, the charter provides that one of the BSA members needs to be a planner with professional qualifications and 10 years experience as a planner or a registered architect. Um, and one of the members needs to be a licensed professional engineer with at least 10 years experience as an engineer. Um, uh, no more than two mayors may reside in any one borough. Each of those members, as I mentioned, receives a salary um, and may not engage in any other occupation, profession, or employment. This is their full-time job. Um, and the members of the board in general receive a salary of $158,156. Um, the BSA, as, as, you, as members know, has the power to determine and vary the applications of the zoning resolution and to issue special permits as authorized by the zoning resolution. The BSA may also consider appeals to vary or modify any rule or regulation or provisions of the law relating to construction, use, structural changes, equipment alteration or removal of buildings or structures or vaults in the sidewalk um, where there are practical difficulties or hardships in carrying out the strict letter of the law so that the spirit of the law shall be observed, public safety secured, and substantial justice done. Um, and I'll make one or two other notes here. I had the opportunity to talk to the, the chair of the BSA in advance um, about this position, uh, uh, position in particular. Um, as we know, people will come before the board seeking to vary a rule for a wide range of reasons. Um, some of those reasons I've been made to understand relate to subsoil conditions and engineering issues and structural issues on the property. So uh, an owner who wants to build a bigger building, for example, will hire an engineer to come and say that who comes and presents evidence that uh, the conditions on the site, subsoil, mandate an extensive uh, foundation or other building structural issue, and therefore to justify the cost of that building, more FAR is needed. Uh, the BSA needs someone who, can, who has that knowledge and expertise to be able to evaluate those applications and determine whether that is on the merits or not. And that's the position here. So you can see why it's important. It's not just one more vote. It's, it's a staff position of substantial expertise. Um, and, you know, there are only so many people who have that expertise. Um, so we're uh, glad to have Nasser Shetta here to be nominated for that position. Um, I will flag before his testimony, and I'll ask some questions about it after, um, that he, uh, unlike most of the people we review, has not been previously a resident of New York City. Um, he was living in New Jersey. You'll hear that he's moving to New York City as part of taking this job. The charter requires that this position be held by someone who's a resident. Um, but unlike sort of, I guess, more representative boards where you kind of have one person from each borough who sits and represents the people, 
um, you know, the primary requirements here are technical expertise, which is what we are uh, reviewing him for. So we'll ask some more questions about that after his testimony just to make sure we've got everything uh, straightforward and as it should be pursuant to the Charter. Um, uh, Mr. Shetta, uh, thank you for being here. If you would please raise your right hand to be uh, sworn or affirmed in. Welcome. Do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, Rules Committee members, you've got a written copy of uh, both opening statements and uh, Mr. Shetta's response to questions in your booklet. And Mr. Shetta, if you would like to make an opening statement, please do so now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Morning. Chair Lander, members of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. Uh, my name is Nasser Shida. I'm greatly honored to be here today to present my testimony regarding my recommended appointment as a commissioner of New York City Board of Standards and Appeals, PSA. If appointed to the Board of Standards and Appeals, I would fulfill the board requirements for an engineer as mandated by the city charter. For the past 25 years, my career has been dedicated to serving the civil engineering community and the public by providing high quality engineering. In addition to my role as an engineer, I teach and assist new generations of civil engineering professionals by enhancing their skills and helping them obtain state license. If I'm appointed, I will look forward to embracing the new role as engineering commissioner of the city BSA. I'm up to the challenge of this role and bringing my experience and expertise to serve the people of New York. I have bachelor degree, master and doctoral degrees in civil engineering with focus on structural, geotechnical, and geotechnical areas. And I'm, licensed, I'm, a, and I'm a licensed professional engineer in New York State, the state of New Jersey, and Delaware. I have also published more than 12 technical papers which cover diversified topics in structural, geotechnical, and geoenvironmental engineering and were presented in international journals and events. Having more than 25 years of experience in academia and in construction industry, my professional experience covered several fields including structural, geotechnical, and site civil engineering teaching and research. After graduating from Cairo University in Egypt with an honor degree in civil engineering, I started my career in Cairo at the Egyptian School Construction Authority, SCA, as a civil engineer. For about six years at the SCA, my job was to design and, in and inspect construction of educational buildings and make sure they are planned and built in such a way to ensure the safety and the interest of public. In 1999, I obtained my master's degree after joining the National Housing and Building Research Center of Egypt, which is the top Egyptian civil engineering institution responsible for preparing construction codes and standards. My main job at the HBRC was to perform and publish engineering research, advise master level students, and provide engineering consultation and practice in examining and participate in examining civil engineers seeking licensure to practice civil engineering in Egypt. By the end of 2003, I obtained my PhD degree in geotechnical slash structural engineering. And later in 2007, I moved to the United States. During the past 15 years, my experience has mainly focused in geotechnical and structural engineering fields, including performing subsurface investigation, studying subsurface conditions, and designing and constructing various types of foundations excavation support, dewatering systems, and waterfront structures and ground improvements. I have worked on various projects with a focus on projects across New York State, 
the state of New Jersey, and other projects nationwide. The projects included high-rise, schools, retail, residential, commercial, and waterfront developments. I'm currently employed by one of the top consulting firms providing geotechnical, site civil, and environmental engineering services nationwide and abroad. During my empl employment with this firm, I volunteered to teach our staff and senior staff engineers various civil engineering topics to help them prepare for and pass the exam typically required to obtain a professional engineering license. My resume indicates how hard I have worked to build and advance my career and to develop my skills and knowledge which will help me reach sound decisions at the BSA. I hope to become a valuable, a valuable resource not only to the board but also for the entire system of the New York City engineering agencies. If appointed, I would ensure the board decisions are made for the interest of the public and with the utmost rigor, integrity, and care. It would be a privilege to serve as a commissioner on the Board of Standards and Appeals, and I, will, and I welcome any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Mr. Shita, thank you very much for that opening statement. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Margaret Chin. Welcome. Uh, and Council Member Mark Levine. Uh, I'll encourage people to look at uh, Mr. Shita's resume and other materials. You see a lot of information there. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, we're lay people here, uh, but if you could just walk us through when you would be reviewing an application of the kind that we're talking about. Someone's come in to say we need a variance because of uh, subsurface engineering conditions. Um, you know, just walk us through what are the kind of materials you're going to look at to figure out whether uh, that variance is warranted, how will you do that uh, analysis or investigation and share your, your considerations with the other members of the board? Sure. F first of all, we will look at the kind of request he's making, what kind of application he submitted, and after that we'll look at the evidences that the applicant has submitted. These evidence could include geotechnical reports, geotechnical studies, testing, environmental uh, reports and studies. Um, we'll take a look at the nature of testing, whether they are suitable for that kind of request, whether they su seem to support that kind of request this applic applicant is seeking. And, and based on the testing, we'll, we'll determine whether the studies and the reports and the testing submitted to the board are sufficient to make a determination. And if not, we might ask him to sub submit additional uh, studies, reports, testing, but if they are enough or sufficient to make a determination, we'll, we'll make such determination. Um, I'll just speak for myself here, although I suspect some of my colleagues feel the same way, that my time in public office has made me more suspicious or skeptical in some cases than I might have been before. So I am sure there are plenty of times when there is a subway right below the site or very soft soil and so, you know, a, a stronger foundation or more expensive one is needed. But I, I'm sure there are also times when a developer looking to build a bigger building than the rules would otherwise allow is looking for any way they could to do it and that this might be a case where they would come in and make a case that it was they just had to because of the conditions. So, um, you know, how would that possibility factor in as you're reviewing, obviously based on technical and uh, objective scientific information, but in a context that might involve a situation of that type? In, in, in general, we'll look at the kind of material he's submitting, we'll look at the site conditions, we'll, we'll have site visits, we'll look at the drawings he's submitting, and, and we'll make an evaluation based on the information. And if we doubt the information he's submitting, and or if, if I believe that the information is not sufficient, I, I believe I have the right to ask him to submit further evidence to support his, his request. But if, if it's evident from the beginning that it's, it's, it's done deal, this application cannot be granted, we'll, we'll make a determination and just reject that application. 
And, you know, you're, it sounds like you're prepared to represent the people here, not be, you know, sort of, a, you know, rubber stamp to a developer proposal, but bring an independent, critical, uh, technical eye to these reviews. I totally understand that, and I hate to be a rubber stamp for anybody. I, I totally understand that. Thank you. I don't doubt it, but I want you to know that's part of what's important to us. So, um, and it's important to us because we hear it from our constituents. So. Um, uh, two more quick questions, and then I'll turn it over to colleagues if they, if they have them. Um, you submitted a letter from the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board. As you mentioned in your testimony, you currently work for Langen, one of the big engineering companies, and exactly where the person of, who has the expertise we're seeking might, might work. Langen, of course, submits, uh, does work on projects which may have in the past and will likely in the future find themselves before the BSA. It's, it's not specifically a BSA agency. It's a giant engineering firm, but their engineering work might wind up there. Um, you have a letter from the COIB. We just ask uh, in all cases that folks indicate, you know, what the, what the COIB guidance is and commit to follow it. I note that you, um, they are perfectly, you're not remaining as a partner or keeping any relationship to Langen. You've identified 25 projects that you worked on, which are not slated to come before the BSA, but could. But if you could just uh, reprise briefly what, what guidance COIB gave you and commit to follow it. Yep. Re regarding my relation to Langen, I'm not a partner. I'm not an associate. I'm a senior project manager. My intention, if, appoint if appointed to that position with the BSA, I'm going to resign. I believe the only tie that is going to be remaining is the 401k, which my intention is to move that to rule it into another private account. Uh, on the other part of the, um, of the question, uh, regarding the projects I did work on with Langen, first of all, none of my projects has come to the BSA on the scope that I participated in. Usually for any engineering construction projects, you have a project team, which could include structural engineer, geotechnical engineer, somebody who's handling parking, and, and the three projects that I'm aware of that came to the board, the part that was submitted to the board didn't include any scope for myself or for Langen. So the scope that was submitted, I believe on one of the projects, which is Sheepshead Bay, the submission was about parking, which was handled by somebody else. Yes, Langen was part of that project team, but Langen was in part of that specific submission. I believe this is the case for the other two projects. Uh, also, uh, I have submitted a list of projects that I did work uh, on with Langen to the board, and my intention, if, if appointed to that position, if one of these projects shows up um, before the board, my intention is to recuse myself and not be part of the judgment on that project. Thank you. I'll note that that goes further than what the COIB letter even says, which is that since you will have severed and not be getting any more compensation from Langen, that wouldn't even be technically required. So you're, you're going beyond what is required in the COIB statement. I appreciate that. Um, and then I want to just ask you to talk to us about the residency issue, which I mentioned in my opening statement. Uh, you have been a resident of New Jersey. As I understand it, you, you saw the ad for this position online. We're obviously looking for someone with technical expertise, and, and you applied. Um, as, as you know, uh, pursuant to the public officer's law, Section 3, uh, you uh, will be required, would be required if appointed an, into this position, to be a resident of the City of New York upon appointment to the BSA. Um, uh, so if you could please explain to the committee the steps you have already taken to establish residency, uh, when you will establish residency, and what uh, evidence or indicia of residency that you will provide uh, to the committee as proof of residency, um, I appreciate that you, you want to know you will be appointed to the position before you quit your current job and move. Uh, you appreciate that we need to follow the public officer's law. So if you could just give us the, you know, tell me, give us the answers to those Sure. Questions. Regarding applying to the job, I, I, I have seen the advert on one of the websites. I, I don't recall the name exactly, but I have seen it online and I have submitted the application and I have been interviewed with the, with the board chair, with the board, some, some of the board members. And uh, yes, they, they told me that the residency is, is needed before uh, starting the job. And, and I already have started taking steps towards uh, moving and establishing residency in the city. 
uh, I have submitted a lease. I have signed the lease yesterday, and I, I have put a security deposit and, and, and the first month's rent. So, and, and my intention within the next uh, week before the voting is to uh, obtain a New York, sta New York State uh, driving license in addition to a voter registration. Uh, so this is, this is still in progress. Great. And I'll note for members that we have uh, the lease agreement in your packet along with a letter from the mayor about uh, not appointing Mr. Sheeta until he has proved the establishment of residency. Um, if you can provide us with evidence on the voters, uh, the voter registration form and the driver's license, uh, you know, I guess they give temporary cards, you know, before we vote next Wednesday, that will, uh, that will help. That's my intention, is to submit the voter registration and the, a copy of the driving license, New York driving license, before the nines. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, those are all of my questions. Uh, Council Members Chin or Vaca, do you have any questions for Mr. Shita? Mark. Any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so you have Yes, okay, one question from Council Member Chief. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. Um, thank you for willing to serve and looking at your, your background. You have quite, you know, the experience um, to serve in this position. Um, oftentimes in the community, um, we get very frustrated um, as Council Member because we don't really um, have too much oversight on these projects that goes directly to BSA. Uh, we can voice our opinion and we can voice our concern. Uh, so I just wanted to hear directly from you, uh, as the chair also asked earlier, how would you make sure that when you review this project that you do take into consideration uh, of concerns and comments, you know, from the community, uh, from elected officials, you know, from the city council, to make sure that it is a full, you know, comprehensive review. Um, because oftentimes, you know, developers use that as a way to get their projects done. They go to BSA. They bypass um, the council and they bypass the, the, the review process. And they, because they have a hardship and they go directly to BSA. Um, so I just wanted to hear directly from you. How do you assure us that you will take, um, you know, into consideration in terms of what the community uh, say and, and their comments and also the elected officials. Sure. When, when, when looking at, and, and this, is, this is coming from my background in the private sector as well, when, when looking at a specific uh, issue or problem, the, the, usually we look at the global picture. We look at all the sides of the picture positive and negative. So in, in case of an application from one of the property owners, we're not, I'm not going to just look at the technical documents and, and testing and these kind of solid uh, documents, but we'll also talk to the public, see, try to understand the impact of, of such request on the public. And, and, and at the end of the day, it's not just the technical document. These technical documents supposed to be prepared to, to serve the public. So if, if making a, a determination or a decision will not be in the favor of the public, we're not going to make that decision or we're not going to grant that, that application. So I, I believe the process should be on one, on one side, it should be looking at technical side. On the other side, it should be looking at the impact of whether decision A or decision B, the impact of that decision on the public themselves. So that, that will be taken into consideration. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Councilmember Williams for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for being here to test, uh, testify. I don't, if I repeat any questions, please let me know. I have to step out. Um, it was just, I'm interested, you have a wonderful resume, but it didn't look like many of it was from, from New York City. Um, and I'm just trying to inter find out um, why do you want to focus so much now on New York City as opposed to so many of the other places that you've worked and brought your uh, expertise to? You're talking about my credentials or my projects? 
Uh, I'm talking about your practice. The credentials are great. It just didn't seem like most of what you've done, I know you're registered here in New York City, but most of the work that you have done didn't seem to be in New York City unless I, um, I'm misreading. So if you can just talk about the experience you had working with in New York City and when that was. I would say 85% of the projects that I did work on within the United States are in the city. The other 15%, I would say uh, probably 12% in New Jersey by nature, and, and the other 3% could be somewhere else in California or in D.C. or in other states, but 85% of the projects I did work on are in the city. Okay, I, I see a lot of... If, if you look at the resume... Yeah, it's, it just, it's, a lot of stuff says uh, New Jersey, Tennessee, Egypt. There's a couple of New York. It, it doesn't seem like it's 80% of... New, of it, 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 it's, the resume doesn't include all the projects I did work on. I see. The resume just includes samples, and this, these samples, it's, it's, I'm trying to present the different types of projects that I handle. I see. But the, the, like if, if I, to gather all the projects I did work on in U.S., at least 85% of these projects are, are within the city. Okay. And how did you hear about the position? Uh, from a web advert and an internet advert. I have seen an advert. An ad, you saw an ad yes, for it? Yes. Okay. On the internet. And then I, I that's how I applied. I, I submitted my application online. And after that, I was interviewed by the board. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Williams. Um, if that is all the questions, then we'll close the hearing. Um, uh, we'll, we'll reopen it on Wednesday just for the purpose, in all likelihood, of admitting into evidence the voting file and the, and the interim driver's license so we can have that as evidence. Um, in any case, and this goes for both applicants, we don't vote. Uh, on the day of the hearing, we do the hearing. That gives us time to talk amongst ourselves and then vote before the council stated meeting next Wednesday. So we may call you back for other questions, but in all likelihood, we'll just take that uh, in, uh, evidence and add it to the file uh, and vote on Wednesday. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We will now move to our second topic uh, and invite uh, Mr. Rivadeneira to come up and make his statement and answer questions. Um, as I mentioned before, if designated by the council and subsequently appointed by the mayor, Mr. Rivadeneira, who is a resident of the Bronx, will replace Yung Yun and serve for the remainder of a three-year term that expires July 4th, 2019. Uh, the Civilian Complaint Review Board is an independent body charged with the duty to investigate complaints of misconduct by police officers toward the public. Uh, board members are required to reflect the city's diversity. CCRB consists of 13 members five designated by the council for appointment by the mayor and generally one from each borough um, on the recommendation of the borough delegation uh, to the speaker, five appointed by the mayor, uh, and then three designated for the police commissioner. Uh, those three are the only members who have law enforcement experience. Uh, and in general, a, a review panel at CCRB consists of one of the members appointed by the mayor, one of the members nominated by the council, and one of the members designated by the police commissioner. CCRB has a civilian staff responsible for conducting investigations of complaints received by the board. Uh, their jurisdiction includes claims, uh, civilian complaints of excessive force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, or use of offensive language. Um, CCRB members are eligible for compensation on a per diem rate at $315 a day, but unlike the prior, uh, the prior uh, nominee, it's, this is a, a board membership and not a full-time job. The CCRB, as I mentioned, separately has civilian staff. So uh, Mr. Rivadeneira is a, is a new nominee for the Bronx uh, position of the council's nominations to the mayor for appointment on the board. So. We welcome you here. You come highly recommended by, by the Bronx delegation. Um, and if you will raise your right hand to be sworn or affirmed in, you can make your opening statement, and then we'll take statements and questions from the board, from the committee. Welcome. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, if you want to go ahead and make your opening statement. Good morning. My name is Michael Rivadonera, and I am a resident of the Bronx. I would like to thank Chairperson Lander and the members of the Rules, Privilege, and Election Committee for this opportunity to testify regarding my potential appointment as board member for the, C 
Civilian Complaint Review Board. I would also like to thank Speaker and Councilmember James Vaca for putting my name forward for consideration. I want to be a CCRB board member to help rebuild trust between the community and the NYPD. I view the CCRB's grievance process as a vital part of diffusing the tension between the community and the police department and replacing it with a culture of trust. A strong community police relationship is a critical component of public safety, and this relationship is only achieved when the parties have mutual trust. Empowering members of the community to express grievances against the misconduct of an officer offers the opportunity for the community to feel respected and gives the department the opportunity to correct the behavior, which essentially is a trust building exercise. I reside in the borough of the Bronx with my family and I've worked for Councilmember Annabelle Palma and Councilmember James Vaca. While working for Councilmember Vaca, I attended CUNY School of Law where I received my JD. I am currently admitted to the first department and have maintained a spotless record as an attorney. I currently work for the YMCA of Greater New York as Senior Director for Government Relations. My daughter will be attending UPK in the Bronx this September. Needless to say, my family has established roots in the Bronx. During my tenure at the City Council, while working, for both community, while working with both community groups and local precincts, I came to see that there was a lack of trust between the community and the police department. That lack of trust fostered a culture in the police department that divorced officers from viewing the community as equal partners. I also had the privilege of working with commanding officers and community affairs units that worked diligently towards developing meaningful and respectful relationships with the community. As a board member, I will work toward fulfilling CCRB's mission to be the avenue for individuals to file grievances against police officers and act as an impartial, unbiased party when reviewing cases and making recommendations to the police commissioner. I believe there are multiple strategies that can and should be employed to improve community police relationships, and the work of CCRB is just one of those strategies. By examining alleged behavior and making corrective action recommendations, the CCRB can help improve community police relationships by building trust, which is the foundation of a strong community police relationship. I thank, thank you again for this opportunity. I now look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you very much for your opening statement. Um, as uh, your recommender and representative of the Bronx delegation, I'll extend to Councilmember Vaca if you would like to make a, make a statement or ask any questions before I ask mine. Well, I just very, want, I very highly want to recommend Michael. Um, Michael uh, was my director of constituent affairs when I first became a councilman in 2006. And then uh, he went on to law school and then he went and uh, worked with Annabelle Palmer, as he indicated. His resume is very, very um, indicative of the kind of person Michael is. Uh, Michael's resume is based on his concern for the community. Uh, his temperament is one that is very well suited to the CCRB. He's fair, he's objective, he's articulate, he's very bright, he's interested, and he's a concerned person. Uh, I can think of very few people uh, that I would recommend more highly than Michael to this position. Uh, I'm honored to have served with him as my chief of staff because he came back to me in later years, just leaving in May, uh, and he was involved in every phase of my office, the legislative phase, the uh, community service uh, phase, uh, the oversight, budget oversight uh, functions that a council member performs, and he was my trusted advisor. So. Um, Michael, uh, I think uh, your service to the city is, uh, is a record you should be proud of, and I'm very proud to advance your name. Uh, I, I know you will serve our city well in the years ahead, and CCRB is, is really a place where we need people like you. So I hope the committee will be um, supportive. Thank you, Councilmember Vaca. Um, so I'll just ask a question or two and then open it up to my colleagues. Um, you know, you have got a great track record and resume, and you're obviously a very uh, even keel, you know, uh, level-headed person. You're, you're, this position is step, you know, steps you into you know, one of the most difficult and contentious spaces in our whole society right now, obviously around uh, civilian complaints of excessive force or police misconduct, uh, obviously something that we're focusing on, and having that system provide genuine accountability 
um, is critical to, uh, to justice and to police community relations. Um, you know, there was a recent report by the CCRB about some of the concerns that uh, even after that whole process, the NYPD disciplinary recommendations are either often reduced or, or not implemented. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a critical and challenging position, and I just wonder if you would reflect a little more on uh, you know, I think you, you presented your uh, skills in a very strong way. You know, how you see playing that role at this moment uh, in, the, in the city and, and broader debate on this critical set of issues. Yeah, um, first, I want to say thank you to Councilmember Mbaka for those kind words. Um, but to, to answer your question, Chairperson, I, the, the landscape, you are correct. It is a contentious landscape that, that we, I'd be entering into. But I feel that the CCRB, um, needs to hold firm its level of professionalism, its level of due diligence while examining these, these cases. Um, that's holding itself accountable is the only way that we can push forward any changes in the NYPD and have recommendations actually considered and imposed. Um, I feel that you know, my skill sets as a critical thinker um, will add to um, increasing that level of professionalism. I feel that um, I will be able to work with my colleagues, um, whichever panel that I would be assigned to, to really examine thoroughly the, the cases and then work um, diligently to pr present um, an argument to the police commissioner that, you know, this is the best course of action. Um, and I can imagine sort of a New Yorker on the street saying to that, well, that sounds wonderful and very professional, um, but, um, I, you know, I think there is some real... Um, I don't know, suspicion's the right word, but concern, you know, it's like, is this really going anywhere? Do we really get the findings that, that we're supposed to get? Do we get the accountability that we're supposed to get? How, how would you respond to a, a skeptical New Yorker about the system that we currently have for accountability? I mean, I would say that currently um, the, things have changed. Um, I have, um, according to my resume, I've worked for the city well over 12 years. I've worked under different administrations, uh, different leaderships, and I've seen um, a, a height of stop and frisk where, you know, there, there was a lack of trust. And I have seen a shift in how the police engage with the community. And I feel that that shift is leading us to where we want to be. We're not there yet. I will admit that, you know, there is a lot of work to be done. But the, the culture is changing between the police department and the community. It is a slow, dragged out process, and I want to be part of that process to change and continue advancing it. Um, all right, are there Councilmember Perkins and then Councilmember Williams? I uh, thank you for your presentation and your presence. You know, this is the biggest, one of the biggest volatile, troublesome issues policy areas that we have going on for in our city, you know, there's the relation, especially with people of color, and, um, and the relationships, generally speaking, are not very good, I and mean, we, we may not have riots and all the other related uh, things that might sometimes come to people's mind, uh, but it's really a challenging situation that's taking place. The communities don't, I would say, really trust the police at the level that one would expect citizens to feel about those who are supposed to be protecting them. So are you familiar with that sentiment that takes place perhaps in the Bronx? I know I, I come out of the Bronx too, so I know a little bit about what's happening in the Bronx. My district is basically in Harlem and East Harlem and the Upper West Side, Morningside Heights. But what is your sense of the temperature uh, of the community vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with the police department in, the, in your area or in the city in general? You know, in, in the Bronx, uh, I can speak to that. Um, I, I, the temperature is that. There are, there are parts of the Bronx that there is that, um, that level of distrust. And, you know, I, I've seen the, the mayor and this particular um, police commissioner put forth, you know, more community policing and wanting to engage. Uh, I don't see that we are going backwards in terms of how the police department is interacting with the community. Um, you know, it, you know, the, 
national discourse right now, of course, is you know the police and the community aren't um, working together. There, there's uh, unfortunate leadership that that is you know putting forth a lot of myths uh, in terms of how communities of colors are. Um, I feel that. You know, our communities are safe communities, and I feel that our communities could become even safer communities when we develop better relationships with the police department. Um, I feel that more conversation, more discourse between the community and the police department is how we achieve trust, um, but we will not achieve that if we stop and go backwards, and I don't see this, this particular administration or this particular police commissioner looking to go backwards. So given the opportunity to sort of make a significant difference, what would you recommend in terms of that relationship? You know, I, I think the administration would have to look at different prongs. It is not just one particular path to answering the question. I feel that CCRB itself is one of those particular prongs. Um, but there are other prongs to better engage the police department with the community. I feel that um, it, it is a multi-level strategy, um, which I feel, based on what I have read in the paper about this administration and the police department, that that is their goal to work on different strategies, and CCRB being one of those pieces. So I hope that you will be useful in that regard because it's really very touchy, uh, even though we, we don't see some of the uh, volatile um, kind of interactions that we may have seen, mm -hmm. but it's always uh, simmering, it seems, on that something might happen. So I just hope that you'll be able to recognize that and uh, attempt to bring some reconciliation, so to speak, a better in interaction because we, we should be trusting the police in our communities, and I don't think we're there yet. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, Council, Council Member Williams. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for, for being here. Uh, obviously, you have a, a nice record uh, uh, behind you, and uh, we appreciate you wanting to get involved, uh, particularly with CCRB. I, um, I actually believe that there's, uh, this administration has done more work on this issue um, than is felt on the ground, and there hasn't been the commensurate change in trust. I don't think the trust has increased from last administration to this one on the ground, although I think there have been some significant changes that they deserve credit for. I don't think we're doing community policing. I always want to make that distinction. I think we're doing some nice things uh, with neighborhood policing, and I am, I am in favor of it. I just don't think it's community policing. I think it's going well. Um, the reason I believe that is is because, uh, unfortunately, with those changes, uh, this administration has basically done nothing when it comes to accountability, same as the last administration. And, and they're doing worse on transparency than the last administration. So they've actually gone backwards. And because of those two things, I think it's the, what's preventing a lot of the trust uh, from moving forward. Um, CCRB, in people's minds, is a way to deal with some of the accountability. But we know that that hasn't been as real as we want it to be. Um, I'm trying to see what you think you can bring, if it's anything different, if it's anything creative, uh, to helping the public understand what CCRB does and doesn't do and help um, push some accountability in maybe ways that I haven't thought of. Uh, there's a young man, Dwayne June, that was shot and killed in my district about two days ago, uh, emotionally disturbed person. The police has an account, um, and we would love to just believe and accept what they're saying, but we can't, unfortunately, because of some of the things that I mentioned uh, previously. We'd like to get to that point. We're not there. Also, my incident that uh, people may remember on Eastern Parkway um, a few years ago, I had a different, a different look, some more hair. Um, a friend of mine um, encountered some unfortunate things. When I went through the CCRB process, the only thing that was substantiated was anything that had a picture or a video. Anything else was not substantiated. And I say that because I appreciate you being even killed, but sometimes there's some false equivalency um, that uh, if you do anything uh, against a police officer, you're anti-cop or something like that. And that's frustrating to me because I know we have the tendency to just automatically believe what the police says. I understand why it's set up that way. Uh, I am a city council member, so I think I should have deserved uh, at least some, some uh, similar thought process, and I wasn't. 
How do you fix that? Like, they, they just said, whatever I didn't have a picture of didn't happen. Uh, and that's unfortunate. I don't think that fosters trust. And I don't think that fosters faith if people come to CCLB. And if they don't have uh, the, the evidence of a camera or a video, then they're just not taken seriously. Uh, my hope is that some of that will be absolved with two things. One, we got to roll out these body cams sooner than later. I have a bill that says right to record, allowing people uh, an affirmative right to uh, film the police. Um, but with that, of course, we know just because it's on camera doesn't mean that we get justice, but at least we're all looking at the same thing. So I'll just stop here and give you a chance to respond to anything I said. No, um, council member, you, you are correct in terms of like there are, there are different strategies um, and that there are setbacks in terms of moving forward. Uh, I feel that you know, at the CCRB itself is a place where um, more outreach, more training for the investigators can be done. Um, that, that is something that the agency can look into doing. The other broader, larger conversation of how do we develop better relationships, um, I think you are correct by pointing out that you know, we need the body cameras to be rolled out soon. Um, we, we do need to hold um, both all parties accountable in terms of like what information is being put out there. And when information is put out there, people have a tendency to, to speak out in terms of, you know, it is okay for me to now make a complaint if others are sharing this um, experience. You know, I think we have to dispel the uh, belief that there is no room to express any um, opposition to what's being done. I feel that um, the CCRB as a grievance agency um, helps dispel those things where, you know, we're trying to encourage individuals to make more complaints about police conduct. I, I feel that the partnership that the CCRB and the council um, is engaged in right now where there are five council offices throughout the summer um, open as drop-in centers to make complaints, I feel that those are small, but those are also things that need to be um, implemented to try to put out information about what CCRB is about and also, you know, help the community understand that, you know, your complaints will be reviewed and that, you know, there, there won't be any retaliation. It, it is a process. It is not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, I, I, and I know your, your work, council member, um, here at the council has been for the full term, pushing for more police accountability. And as you see, that it is a long process. And I think that's what the CCRB, and one of the things that I want to take to the CCRB is that this is a process, and we have to keep moving forward. We can't let things set us back. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, just to reiterate, again, there's been a lot of good work done, and, and I appreciate all the discussions of police and community working together, which I continue to push forward. Um, all of that good work, just for clarity, without real accountability, without transparency, doesn't get to the heart of what we are trying to do, uh, which is substantive change in the trust relationship. And so CCRB is important there. I wish they had some um, stronger authority to do things, uh, but they don't. And so hopefully whatever you can bring at least can help with what powers they do have. Thank you. And, and I'll just extend this a little. You know, we had, when we had the budget hearing with CCRB earlier this spring, they presented a very good new data transparency initiative. And, and I think that things at CCRB, in terms of their process for investigating and substantiating uh, complaints, uh, making people feel comfortable reaching out to offices and making recommendations has grown stronger. Unfortunately, as their most recent report shows, it's also increasingly true that the NYPD don't utilize those recommendations or they either downgrade them or, or don't take them all together. So it's hard to figure out how you could ask New Yorkers to feel more trust in the accountability system, but that, you know, that's not something that, that goes to what, what you can do inside the, inside the CCRB and it remains a critically important, a critically important function. I'm sorry, I, I just want to say one thing on the record, which is, which is a nod because I, you know, the space we're in is different. I want to make sure I acknowledge that. Uh, we have uh, stops are down. I do know that there are stops happening that are not being counted, which is troublesome. But I think even with that, um, stops are down, and hopefully they're being done constitutionally. Uh, shootings are down, murders are down, 
and to the credit of the NYPD, complaints against officers are down. And I think that is something that we have to account for, which is why I'm saying, even with that, uh, the trust level I don't think has changed. Uh, and those are, and the reasons I mentioned before are, are part of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your willingness uh, to serve and for coming down here this morning to answer our questions. As I mentioned earlier, we don't vote uh, at the end of the hearing. We have some time to talk amongst our, our colleagues on the committee. We'll go into recess and then resume from recess on the 9th in advance of the stated council meeting. Uh, so thanks everyone for their attendance and with that, uh, the committee is in recess.